Uh, okay, so I lead a place called the Interaction Research Studio, which is in the design department of Goldsmiths um, College, the University of London. We're a fairly self-contained separate group within the design department. There's a dozen of us. Everybody in the studio are, well, except for myself, are contract staff, research assistants, research fellows, senior research fellows, professorial research assistants. Our team is not made up of students, and that's really important because everybody always forgets that. Um, we have been working together since 2005, and in fact, some of us have substantial proportion have been working together before that at the Royal College of Art. Um, the newest hires on our team are like been with us at least a year. So we're really a well-established group. Uh, we have a strong culture, and we wor we've worked together and know how to do what we want to do. Um, we're made up of a mixture of designers primarily, but also people trained in sociology and in technology. Um, however, we don't kind of pay attention to disciplinary boundaries within our, in our studio. Everybody kind of mucks in and does what they can and joins in in very different flexible ways to achieve the work of the studio. Um, and that's about what I want to say there. So the, the, what we do on the whole is, is a series of projects in which we use design as a means of research into people and technology. So on the one hand, we're inter interested in kind of opening the, the ways that we think about roles technologies can play and ways that it can work. But we really do this also to explore the values and activities and orientations that people are willing to engage with. So it's equally an investigation of what we are about as humans as it is about technology and the intersection between the two. We do this largely through creating um, highly finished, fully functional uh, prototypes of what we might call experimental computational devices. They often take the form of appliances, furnishings, and fittings for everyday spaces, such as the home, but others as well. And we've done a variety of them over the years, ranging from briefly the drift table down on the bottom, whatever direction it is, right, um, is an early piece we did, which is a table with weight sensing that you can place objects on a press on, and it controls the slow scroll of aerial photography under a lens that makes it look not like a screen. So the effect is to create a kind of digital hot air balloon for the home. It isn't, you know, key to that piece is it's not for anything. There's no task or function for it. It's a situation that we create that we ask people, that people can make meaning of in their own ways. Um, um, <laughs> the piece that the, the, enough. The piece at the top there is called the Prayer Companion. We built that for a, um, a set of, of nuns who live, cloistered nuns who live in a monastery, and it basically streams content from the internet about current events and people's um, feelings at the time to resource their prayer activity, and so on. There's a number of these projects. I would like nothing better than to tell you about each one, but obviously I don't have time, and I'm a good student, so I'm following the brief. Um, <laughs> It is really key to the way we work that we don't make these things just for fun. We make them to give to people to try over extended periods of time in their everyday life. So we field trial these things in, in the wild, as we say in England, for periods of months to um, years. Uh, the prayer companion, for instance, has been in the monastery for something like three years now. Um, and that is kind of what we do. Now let me talk about, I want to kind of frame, unfortunately, very briefly about how I see what I think about doing design as research, because I think it's quite different from doing um, HCI research or scientific research or humanities research. I think it, it has its own logic, and that logic needs to be respected and can be respected. So this is a key quote. This sort of captures a large part of, uh, captures some of how I think about what is required or what is possible in doing design as research. It comes from a paper by Peter Wright and John McCarthy where they're talking about Dewey's um, understanding of design. And the, you know, there's the, the key thing is that whereas the natural sciences are, um, seek to describe the way the world is, design's problem is to create an understanding of the way we might want the world to be. And thus, instead of objective description, it's necessary to place creative imagination and waves of, ways of seeing at the center of our approach. And that very much sort of gets the flavor of what we try to do to some degree throughout our process. Um, and I would love to say more, but I can't. So I'll tell you that. This also colors the trajectory we take to our design research. This shows the various stages of exploring a context, coming up with proposals, refining them into prototypes, and then assessing them in the field to draw some kind of conclusions. Um, like any of these diagrams, and I recognize that this is a dime a dozen, these sorts of things, you know, the truth is much more messy and stuff 
comes in from anywhere and loops back in on itself and, and you know, it's all a mess. But it's a convenient for fiction, fiction for structuring how we talk about what we do. Um, and in this talk, then, I'm going to focus mainly on how we try to do research to establish a context for design and, you, and then what, how we actually do the, do the what you might call evaluation to figure out what's happened when we've done something. And I'll sort of touch on intermediate stages just so you get a feel. And none of this, well, never mind. So it, it has become clear to me over the years that one of the key stages in our design process is the framing of the project in the first place. So almost all our projects are done as publicly funded research projects funded from the UK councils or the EU or so forth, sometimes with industry. Therefore, we may, reply, we may respond to calls, but we're really defining the projects themselves. And it is important, the way I believe our work works um, is that we frame those projects in terms of context or situations or, or problems that we think are likely to produce interesting issues of topical and theoretical importance, but we don't frame them around technologies or around particular solutions, and we only hint at the kind of approach we will take because the design process is one of emergence and discovery throughout. And, but that framing is really crucial, and I think without the appropriate framing, what we do wouldn't work. Um, once we start in on the project, we spend a fairly substantial amount of time exploring the context, and we do this using a, a really wide variety of very eclectic sources. And, and so we will look at technical literature, or literature from HCI, you know, research about from sociology or from wherever. We will look at you know, academically respectable sources of information of the, about things. And we will also take guidance from things like STS or, and so forth. But equally, we also look at artworks dealing with the domains that we're interested, we're interested in and um, artistic movements that we found interesting, like situationists or surrealists or whatever. We will also look at um, sources from anywhere. So we will, go, we will take seriously um, newspaper articles from the gutter press. You know? um, we've got, we will take um, niche publications about, for instance, how to hide contraband in the home. And in a sense, we pile it all in to, get, to build up a kind of picture of the domain in which we're working and to, to give us hints about method, methodological approaches and the kind of values we might explore. And we don't particularly privilege one source of information over another because we're not, well, we'll get to that. The other thing we've done over the years, and this, is fairly, for, this has been around for a while, is that um, in the 90s at some point, Tony Dunn and I kind of invented an approach called the cultural probes that we still work with in my studio. And the original cultural probes were, the idea was to collect a, seri a, a series of, evo of evocative tasks that would elicit sort of inspiring information from people but not in a traditionally sort of scientific or social scientific way. So this is from a, a fairly, this is kind of canonical example of cultural probes where we, we gave a bunch of households in London a variety of materials including, for instance, a camera with requests for pictures on the back like take a picture out your back window or take a, take a picture of the spiritual center of your home or take a picture of something red, just ways to get inside, views into the home. Or we gave them a, a set of tags marked house rule where we asked them to write down the implicit and explicit rules from the home. Anything from wear, don't wear your shoes on the carpet to don't talk about politics at the dinner table. Um, we gave them a diagram to, ma to map, or rather we asked them to diagram their friends and families, which is traditional social scientific technique, but we gave them images. This is the middle picture on the left images to create those diagrams on as a kind of constraint. That one is a picture of Dante's heaven and hell. Um, <laughs> and I could tell you stories, but I won't. Um, and we also, we also the, my, one of my favorites is the one that's just to the right, sort of middle right on the top row. It's called the dream recorder. It's a digital recorder that we give to people and ask them when they wake up from a vivid dream to pull the tab, at which point a little light goes on. They have 10 seconds to tell us about their dream after which the recorder shuts down. They can't listen to it, they can't edit it, they can either give it back or not. And it made me a total believer in sort of Freudian dream analysis. Um, so that's quite good. So that's the feel, but probes have been kind of taken up in the research community, but often taken up in a very kind of, uh, um, through their surface characteristics, not through their kind of deeper approach. And I just show you, oh, sorry, I should, if we skip the slide there. I should say probes, one of the key points about probes, we get masses of information back and when, you know, the way we design probes, the, the, the information is very difficult to analyze. 
It's very difficult to compare different things. Um, it's very different to sort of draw clear lessons, and that's the point. The point is to find things that will put us into a situation where one foot is in a kind of empirical relationship with the people that we're working with, and the other foot is off there trying to make sense of the mess and but you know having our imagination and, and interpretations sort of spurred by that in a way where we're always sure that we're not sure. <laughs> okay? As I say, this stuff has been taken up, but often in a kind of way that pays attention to surface characteristics, ignores the value of, of confusion and ambiguity. And so, you know, another example of probes we've done in a recent project is we worked with a children's book illustrator to create an unfinished storybook for adults where we, the trope was you've been shrunk to the size <coughs> of a pea and you're wandering around your home and various pages introduce situations or possibilities for exploring that scenario. We gave them out to households around London and they, you know, asked them to finish them off with a variety of pictures, drawings, and so forth. And we, again, as, as, as usual, we got some amazing results. Um, really inspiring, you know? We're waiting to do, well, people are interesting. <laughs> so, you know, there's a kind of motto behind all of this, you know, everything I've said, which is that what we're doing in this initial context setting phase is looking for inspiration, not information. Because we are aware that we are not, we're not acting as social scientists or whatever. We're not going to write a definitive account of the context. We are not kind of accountable to being comprehensive or even accurate. What we're trying to do is pile into our heads stuff about the context that will allow us to find interesting new ways to explore that context. And in fact, rather than try to summarize that, our response is through the things we design. And so, I feel like an auctioneer. The next phase of our um, project then is to start to explore design possibilities. We do not, again, hold ourselves terribly accountable to the previous research. We start spewing out ideas. We um, have we generally do this um, not only through sketching and brainstorming or whatever methods you know, one uses, but through the creations of series of um, workbooks, which are slightly more formalized, finished um, versions of sketches in which proposals are captured as combinations of evocative images and often quite short textual statements. They capture a design direction or idea in a way that they can be shared within our studio. And the interesting thing about these, in a sense, is that being formal, they kind of knock it back from personal ownership, but they're entirely mutable and open, so that they are pretty much everything in any proposal is open, to pl open for change. What this does is help us to create a kind of space of possibilities for design um, that we can work with over time, often months, we work with that space until finally, at some point, we'll say, I know what we're going to make. We're going to make this. And at that point, the project turns around, and we go into the kind of next phase, which has to do with developing, making the things itself, which again takes um, a more or less infinite amount of time, um, of months of going sort of from right to left, top to bottom, of sketching and refining sketches of computer generated, um, you know models of different forms and possibilities of making models, you know, full-scale models out of cardboard or whatever to test out the proportions of things and finally ends up in, um, you know, computer models of, or computer specifications of the things themselves like, to quite a bit of detail, lots of technical exploration and finding components and working with them and so forth until we finally create and construct the whole piece, often using, these days, using rapid prototyping machine, laser cutter, and other equipment that we have in our very own studio. So we're quite self-contained, and that's kind of cool. That was, that, it's pretty easy. No, it's actually very, <laughs> very core to the um, work. There is a huge amount learned about through that process, and I don't have time to talk about it. So let's go to evaluation. So at this point, by this time in a project, what we've done is create a, a very highly finished, fully functioning prototype of an elect a computational device. And I should point out, these things are all, almost always to a higher degree of finish than I have seen produced by virtually any other research organization. And we like that. Um, and we do that because we love it. We, we're, that's what, who we are. We really like producing these things. But also because if you have a very highly finished prototype, then if you put it in the field, people relate to it very differently than if you have something that's kind of a sketchy, half, half done model. Um, we, then go, we then start working in, with field trials. This may or may not involve people that we originally went to with probes. We sign people up. We try to get people from a very general public. We have done stuff like put in newspaper ads. We've hung signs on trees. We've gone to blogs. We try to get people who are 
totally disconnected from us or, or the academic research we do, although ask me about it later, self-selection means that we're not quite as diverse as I would sometimes like to be, or any of us would like to be. Um, we deploy things usually in people's homes, not always. We usually go, some group of us go to people's homes and give them the objects. We, very, we usually just say, here is a blah, and this is what it does, and this is how you operate it, and, we, and that's what you need to know. We do not tell them about our research agenda. We tell them usually very little about who we are, where we're from. We just give them the thing and say, see what you make of it. Um, but that often involves the production of subsidiary materials. So this is a, that screenshot is of a kind of one-page user guide that we gave out with the recent deployment, um, which are themselves, you know, work of great uh, result of great work. And so the idea is to kind of, in a sense, simulate what it would be like to get a commercial product in your home. Though of course it's different in many ways. And then we leave the things with people over long periods of time with the occasional visits that I'll tell you afterwards. Now, in thinking about evaluation. There's kind of two phases to evaluation, and this is a new, this is something I might not have said a few years ago, but in truth, one of the, way, one of the first and least interesting ways that we evaluate something is to see whether people engage with it over time. So there's several sort of trajectories of appreciation that we've observed. Almost always the first phase looks like the yellow bit on the left. People get the, get the things, they're really enthusiastic, they've been given some new piece of technology they've never seen before, and they're really excited and get all kind of enthused about it. And then there's the, the, the downturn when they realize that actually it's not that great, really, and it doesn't do all the things that maybe they can imagine would do. And they kind of, yeah, whatever. And, um, and that's all fine. That happens over a period of days or weeks or something. And that's where most user studies stop, but that's where ours starts, because that's when you've gotten over the kind of novelty thing. And it's what happens afterwards that's of real interest to us. So in many of our deployments, m most of our deployments, you see something like the green line, where after that, people reach some state of engagement with the object. It goes up and down. They'll play with it some and leave it around. But it'll kind of maintain sometimes over very, very long periods of time. I mean, in, in our successful projects, that engagement lasts for the extent of the project. The other thing we have seen, and it's, and it's awful when it happens, but it's kind of nice to know that it can happen, is something like the red line, where after people get disappointed, they get more disappointed and more disappointed, and then they get disengaged and then they stop using the device, and maybe even ask us to get it out of their house. And what's, <laughs> what's bad about that is that it means that all this effort has not worked and we've got a failed product. What's really nice about that is that it means that it's possible to fail in this kind of testing, and that means it's also possible to succeed in a meaningful way. And so we've seen that a few times, not too often, thank God. We've seen one in a recent deployment, which, I mean, a current deployment, which is more like the yellow line, and I'm still getting my head around it, where the engagement has dropped quite a bit uh, to the point that we thought, oh, God, we failed again. And then we find that they're, they're periodically re-engaging with the devices over time in interesting ways that they find valuable. And in fact, they don't want us to remove the things from their homes. And we realize that that's actually more typical of many of our possessions. That's not my phone, is it? No. Um, that's it. You know, the things that we have around our home, which you leave on a shelf for a long period of time, you might engage with. So you know, that's, that's something to think about. But as I say, this level of engagement is is a kind of a pass fail, but what we're really much more interested in is an evaluation in which we understand a kind of narrative of what these things mean to people and how, and how, they, how they're engaging with them and what kind of values they bring to play and so forth. We use several methods to, do, to try to get at that. One is to, do, is to use ethnography, um, pretty standard in the field. We have trained ethnographers on our team. We have real ethnographers, not those kind of pseudo HCI ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that, okay? Um, I just tweeted it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, well, well, that's a longer story. But anyway, so, so they do the traditional thing of hanging out, you know, sometimes for days at a time in people's households. They'll interview them, talk to them. And key to the, you know, we, we kind of use an ethnomethodological approach in which the the concerns and the categories aren't given in advance, but actually emerge from how people talk about it and the kind of concerns and issues that they find in the things that we make for them. Not always, because we've been doing this for a while. We see things recur that we're interested in over time, but largely this is all emergent kind of uh, meaning making. And that's cool. That is our bread and butter work. It's, it's, that's how we kind of basically establish a sort of frame of 
of, of understanding of what's been going on in, in whatever, wherever we're deploying these things. But then we try more experimental design-led approaches. Um, so I'm interested in, I mean, we're all we're interested in this notion of multiple kinds of interpretation or, or sense making of the object. So rather than come to kind of one unitary narrative about what's happened in our deployment, we like to gather, we like the idea and sometimes actually achieve to gather multiple narratives about the meaning and, and, and the activities around the things we've made. One of the things we've used uh, um, a bit, quite a bit actually, is documentary film where we hired independent documentary filmmakers outside our studio or the academic context, professional documentary filmmakers, bring them in and at best tell them very little about the project, say, here's a household, they've got one of our devices, go visit them and they'll tell you about it. And ask them to make a documentary film about the deployment without, and make it very clear that despite the fact we're paying them with the muddies, the power relations all over, we're not interested in a cell piece, we're interested in a film. Can I show two minutes of this if I don't go on forever? All right, so I, I went through some time <laughs> figuring out what I wanted to show. I, I decided to take the risk because actually these things are often most interesting with, with troubled deployments. So I'm going to show you one of a deployment that um, is not the best ever because you'll, it sort of will make, yeah, anyway. What? Is to what purpose? <laughs> every day that machine churns out a horoscope of sorts, and every day I hear it coming out at half past eight if I'm in the kitchen. And I think, what's it going to say to me today? So I do actually go and read. I've never not read it. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> well. Have you got a quiet place? You've been so busy trying to figure out what to do next that you've forgotten you're not alone. Such a hectic pace has left little time for yourself, let alone for family. The heady mixture of good fortune, laced with the kind of brimming self-belief you haven't felt in ages, puts you in an enviable position to find success, happiness and satisfaction at home and abroad. It seems to me that the earlier ones are less about emotions. It seems more observing of, of, of a busy life around here without making as many assumptions about how I should or will react. As this has gone on, it, 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 it's coming out with things that are more off the wall completely. To be honest, I don't even know if these things are doing anything. These little boxes with small antenna on them could be just plastic boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Prediction. Couture horoscope based around your real activity rather than the star's activity. I think that the, the term horoscope uh, has been banded around a little too loosely here. I don't know if they've programmed any of their data based on um, star lines. I don't think so, because they've never asked me for my birthday. They might be trying to establish where their behaviour I, I, what predisposes sure. events. It's got to be something much more fundamental than that. Much more simple. I've seen that machine opened up, and I know I'm a computer more. It's <laughs> <laughs> happening on the machine. So it's definitely a feedback between the sensors and what's happening on the machine. Right, okay, that's the end of that excerpt. That is an excerpt. The full thing is much better. But uh, just to explain, what we had done is build a system where we were kind of trying to simultaneously criticize some ubiquitous computing approaches to sensing emotion in the blah, around the home and <laughs> offer a solution. And the system basically sensed various activities around the home we thought were th actually, after discussing with them, we thought would be emotionally diagnostic and then mapped the, mapped the kind of um, activities and, and emotions and dimensions of well-being in the home to a set of horoscope statements that we had gathered from um, a variety of online horoscopes and then coded according to the same dimensions. And it's a brilliant idea. I tell you, this is 
but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> and so, and that's a longer story. But what, what, what I love, what I think is really interesting about using this kind of documentary process is you're hearing these people talk about it to each other and to the documentary filmmaker. They're kind of performing to the filmmaker, but they're not performing to us. And they're not in a traditional evaluation cycle. And there's not a lot. There's nobody knows the true agenda behind this project in that room. And that, that's cool. So you get a, a new view into how people are doing this stuff. The other thing we've done, and you know, we've done a lot of documentary film. It wins on a number of different points of view. But we've also worked with journalists. So in the project with the nuns, we contacted the editor of a Catholic magazine in England and interested her in writing an article about it, again, independently. So she went off and talked to the nuns and wrote an article about it that gave us, uh, that gave us an insight into how the thing was working from a Catholic point of view, which was cool. Um, unfortunately, she then went and sold the article elsewhere and, and started a little media feeding frenzy, which imposed upon the privacy of the nuns. But that's another story. And it wasn't my fault. And the last thing we've done is to, um, <laughs> although I did suffer badly, I felt very guilty about it. Um, the nuns assured me it actually didn't bother them, but that too is another story. Um, the other thing we've done is to hire a poet, um, a published poet, to come in and look at some of our devices in the same project, but a different area. We built a device that showed an endlessly scrolling series of Wikipedia images thematically controlled to people in a older people in a care home as a way of opening the home out to the outer world, which is um, good for a number of things. And she, came, she went to the care home, watched them living with this, um, with this device, and wrote a poem, which is really lovely, though very melancholy, about the device and um, aging and um, the fact that it was really snowy that day. Um, and I'd love to get it you know, sort of deconstructed with you, but I think I'll push on instead. But what it is clear about this and actually documentaries is that they are single points of view. And they're not any more authoritarian than any other point of view. They're no more authoritarian than the ethnographies or anything else. They are points of view into the project. And, the, and it's that kind of disrupting of the authoritative account that's what's, I think, really interesting about working in this way. So I wanted to say a little bit about what we draw from this. I'm not going to do a good job this, if, with this. But I want to, I, you know, with these projects, at the end of the day, what we normally, well, almost all these projects ends up getting published into academic um, contexts almost always these days in the CHI conference, just because that's the community I know and who have accepted me. Um, and, but they also often are things are exhibited. So for instance, prayer companions at MoMA right now, or they get written up by the design press or the popular press and stuff like that. So, but the really core is I do consider this a form of academic research. And it's how we return the um, knowledge that we gain through these kind of projects, which is challenging and interesting. Recently, John Bowers, who is um, uh, in my studio, who is a fantastically brilliant person and who you should all immediately get to know. Um, and I have been working on the notion of, of annotated portfolios as a way of trying to draw knowledge from these projects. So we usually talk about these things as case studies. There are themes that run through our work about ambiguity or openness to interpretation or ludic engagement with the world. But we also return in the papers much more domain-specific understandings of what we've achieved. So for instance, ways of addressing older people, ways to make the interaction available to them, values that they might have. But then even beyond that, we're interested in the idea of gathering together portfolios of objects as a way of going beyond specific pieces to gather more general lessons about, for instance, here this has to do with interactional qualities of the things we make, um, or here about some of the ways that people engage with the things we make. We can draw up these longer, larger lessons from across multiple examples. But what's really important about the notion of the portfolio is to maintain the link between the actual designs and the abstractions, not to simply abstract away from the specific pieces to keep those pieces as very much a part of the story, to keep the kind of specificity, particularity of the devices in play in trying to draw out what these things teach us. And that's, that's me. I'm done. Thank you.